Hello, I'm Matt Peterson. And I'm Rich Trapier. And this is episode 43 of History on the Table. Happy holidays, Rich. Yeah, the early happy holidays new year. to you. It is almost 2023. Can you believe it? I can. If it, it feels to me that 2022 was just a long year. and this, it, The time feels right. Yeah. This particular Christmas season seemed like it went past really fast this year at a lot of concerts. And I think the fact that Christmas was on a weekend kind of made it feel like there was one weekend less. So the last few weeks have really flown by for me. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like the the build up to the end of the year is always crazy for us. And then uh, a little news on our front is due to uh, COVID poking its ugly head back up again. We're changing our release schedule. So we're recording on what should have been our end of the year recap night. We're pushing that back uh, a week or so. And so, yeah, with COVID, it was a very long uh, five days over Christmas in isolation. Um, so time did slow down there, I yeah. guess. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's, everyone's doing good. And I think, uh, we're back in action. You know, the, the one good thing about that, the, the silver lining is the amount of stuff like I was able to accomplish while in, in isolation, like, um, you know, it's really easy to fall in the trap and just watch hours and hours of, you know, name your favorite TV <laughs> show. But I, I really tried to uh, focus on Pacific War. I got some reading in. Uh, but that's about all you can do. Excellent. Yeah, so. I can't wait to talk okay. about Pacific War. Yeah, I, I am too. So this, I don't think this will be our as typical long-winded episode. I think we have some stuff to get through first and then we're going to get right into Pacific war. And as I said, and as we've talked about in past episodes, we're splitting up. Normally this Pacific war will be tacked onto the end of the year stuff. We're going to have two episodes. So you'll have Pacific war, a few other topics. We have some listener questions. We're going to talk about uh, the Charles S. Roberts awards. We'll do all that tonight and then we'll reconvene next week and do our best stuff. Sounds good. Always leave them wanting more. Any other uh, business you want to knock out before we uh, just get going? No, let's get let's jump into it. All right, let's let's talk about some games, uh, and and we have we have some crossover here, and I think it's probably because of the miniature market sale, and that's yes, Charioteer. Yes, exactly why. <laughs> yeah, so Charioteer is a new game from GMT. the The big thing for Charioteer here for me, other than the theme, is this is from the designer of Seki Gahara. Mm-hmm. That's pretty sweet, uh, Matt. Calkins, which the I mean, having played both games, I I would never have guessed that. There's like nothing about it that reminds me of Second Gahara, so it's a it's a very different game, but it was it's cool. Nice, yeah. So it's a chariot racing game, uh, you know, in the Circus Maximus, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, some of the guys that I played with actually were talking about that game, so I've never played that one. I don't know if how close this is to that, but yeah. Oh, in the Circus game. Maximus game, uh huh. Yeah, yeah. So like you're racing in the Circus Maximus. There is an MMP game called Circus Maximus, right? Yes. An older game, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this one, uh, yeah, it's uh, well, we'll talk about it later because I actually played it. But yes, I did pick it up, and like you said, I picked it up. Um, I, it was on my radar, and I was thinking about it, and then Miniature Miniature Market put it on sale for fifty bucks. So I was like, "Yeah, that seems like a good price for that game," and I I picked it up and we played it. Nice. I am pretty excited. In addition to that, uh, of a game that uh, had completely eluded me, and it made an appearance on Judd Vance's best of for twenty twenty two, which is an annual geek list from Judd that he does where he ranks his top 100 games of all time, and he, he like, factors in points based off when they're last played, and yada, yada, yada. Ooh, and this, this was a new appearance this year. So, Rich, you're a <laughs> fan of, of Men of Iron, right? Sure, absolutely. So, take Men of Iron. Okay. But add Chip Pull. Okay, sounds and good. And you, like you have Sign of the Pagan. Sign of the Pagan. See, I've never even heard of that game before. Is it a new game? No. Uh, so this is a Richard Berg design, okay. and it was published by Victory Point Games before Victory Point Games was bought out, and then the war game side of Victory Point Games was kiboshed. Okay. 
So what's the uh, what's the what's the era on this? Yeah, so it's Attila the Hun. Okay, and the Battle of uh, C- Catalanian Fields. E. Yeah, that sounds about right. Cool. Yeah, I th- there's. I, sh- I should have looked some more. Um, there are. It's not like very in- intent. Like it's a victory point games box, so there's not like a ton of stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and I don't know like if there's a ton of battles or anything like that. But I mean, for a little bite sized Men of Iron, yeah, I'll give it a try. And also, I don't know if it's a game we're just gonna see again. Mm-hmm. One, it was a victory point games, but it was a war game, so. They're not going to publish it anytime soon. Sure. It was a bird game. He's passed away. I just, I, I feel like it's a pretty unique offering. So cool. Well, I can't wait yeah. to hear how you like it once you play it. Yeah, for sure. Um, technically, I did not add this game to my shelf because it won't fit on the shelf. <laughs> um, but I finally got my copy of Frosthaven. So what's that? Probably two years in the making or whatever since the Kickstarter came out. And, uh, yeah, so it is. It is in my house. I have looked at the rule book. I haven't started playing it yet, um, mostly because we, as the family, we want to finish up the uh, pandemic season zero, the le- pandemic legacy. Once we finish that one up, I think we're going to start Frosthaven. So probably next week we'll get started on that one. It is huge. It's a thirty-eight pound game. It's bigger That's than Gloomhaven. Yeah, it's bigger than Pacific War. Yes, it is. <laughs> Nice. I have so I'm very jealous of this, but we have Gloomhaven. We never want to set it up. We both like the game, yeah. and then I have Jaws of the Lion, mm-hmm. um, and I hope maybe next year we'll dive into that just for the ease of you just kind of get Jaws of the Lion out, and then my understanding is it's you don't have the setup woes. Yeah, yeah. Gloomhaven is a lot better if you can do a dedicated table. Yeah, I could see that for yeah. sure. Nice. I had one more. I had some other stuff. I'm not going to talk about it. But this one was featured on last episode of Advance After Combat. Matt talked about this. What a great name. Um, <laughs> Levy and Mass. So talking about Victory Point Games, this was an original Victory Point Games. And then the rights were moved over to Worthington Games. And they did a beautiful updated copy of it. And this is a States of Siege game covering the french revolution cool so states of siege it, it's uh it's a solitaire game then right it's a solitaire game okay. yep but i like states of siege and this is a nice production of it and they were running a holiday sale when i bought my copy not that i need to defend it but uh, yeah states <laughs> of siege is like a is really a sweet spot for me I, it's i don't think it's ever going to be a system that if, if someone came out and did something with it it's going to be like whoa this is the best thing i've ever played but it is solid solitaire fun that doesn't really get in the way of itself like you just you just kind of play it and that's that's good i think ottoman sunset's the only one i've played yeah and that's fine like ottoman sunset's a fun game it's not an amazing game if it's a shame that victory point games isn't still around because if you could pick up ottoman sunset for 20 30 bucks Mm -hmm. it's totally worth it now those games are so far depending i'm like i see the victory point games version of this is like for like a hundred bucks or something yeah and that's just which is crazy crazy because it's a small game i mean it's it's only because of scarcity so right and you can go get a brand new copy of this from um worthington okay so or okay here's english edition forty dollars but there are some that are listed for a hundred hundred bucks but you get my point some of these don't tell the emperor whatever has skyrocketed because it was only ever made by victory point games and like you just can't get it Mm mm-hmm so that's good stuff. I will apologize. I had COVID. Rich, you had a nasty bug before and during Christmas. And so you may get some coughing. And I'm just, <laughs> if it happens in the middle of something, I'm not going to edit it out. So. I'm staying lubricated. Hopefully that'll help. There you go. There you go. All right. I think that's it for games. Yeah. That, that's all I picked up this month. All right. I read a ton over the last month. I really did. None of it was historical fiction or historical nonfiction. Okay. That's all right. So take it away. We'll forgive you in that. Well, really, the only one that I've got under this category is Crusaders, which I already talked about last month, but I did finish it this month. So um, good book. It's by Dan Jones. If you have read anything by Dan Jones, um, I'm, you know, I, I've read, I think, three of his books now, and I, I've liked them all. He's a great author. So obviously this one is about the Crusades, and it goes um, 
you know, covers a lot of time period, even covers a, a few games that we've talked about on this show, like uh, Al Moravid is in there and stuff like that, as well as some others. So um, great game, and it makes me want to play a Crusades game. On nice. Christian Soldiers, which I've never played, but I want oh, to. So good, so good. Uh, yeah, I really want to read this. This is on my uh, 2023 list for yeah. sure. I, think, I need uh, some Dan Jones in my life. I think Templars will be the next one I read by him, or oh. maybe the, the one on the War of the Roses. One of those two will be next. Can't go wrong. Yeah. Very good. All right, let's keep talking about games then. Uh, yeah, you mentioned playing Charioteer. Yeah, I did. What did you think? I, uh, it was fun. We played it at the uh, at our St. Louis Historical Gaming Society monthly game day a couple weeks ago at Miniature Market. And we, I think we actually played with a full six players, and it was fun. Um, we, we played a lap um, just to sort of learn how to play, and then that was with five of us, and then the sixth person showed up, so we started over, and then we played two laps before we ran out of time. The full game is three laps. So you can... You can easily play a three-lap game in a couple, three hours tops, even if you're learning the game. Um, it's, you know, you, you play cards. You play kind of like, mm, the easiest way to describe is kind of like suits of cards that also, also match cards in the middle to give you bonuses to move your chariot. But there's different moves you can do. You can damage other players. You can recover damage yourself. You can just do pure speed. You can do special moves around the corners. You can do things to make the crowd happy and the emperor happy. And there's lots of little things. Um, it's a very, overall, it's a simple game, but it's fun. And uh, yeah, I recommend it. It's it's definitely like, a, it would be a great late night con game. Would it really take three hours? That seems long for, i mean especially how they for six it. players if you don't know what you're doing and you want to play the full three laps it might go three but uh, uh no not not normally okay. it wouldn't not when you know the game okay Correct. Very good. nice uh i just wanted to mention we're plugging away in our bayonets and tomahawks <clears throat> game all my basically all my other war gaming was pacific war any mm-hmm. free chance was as much pacific war as i could cram in uh but the one break from that was our campaign game of Bayonets and Tomahawks, and I guess stuff on Rally the Troops. I'm actually having a fantastic game of Wilderness War, speaking of French Indian War. Um, but, you know, Bayonets and Tomahawks was up for a Charles S. Roberts Award, and I don't know if you remember last year around this time, I kind of waffled between Atlantic Chase and uh, Bayonets and Tomahawks mm-hmm. as, as my favorite of the year. And the most, like, I had high hopes for Atlantic Chase, but I think Bayonets and Tomahawks was the most surprising. Nice. And going back to the campaign game has kind of cemented like how much I like that game. It's it's fine if you do a little one year scenario, but like the setups and trying to build momentum in like you can't maintain a base in the middle of, you know, like the northeast North American wilderness. Mm-hmm. And it's not a big a consequence if you're only playing a year because you don't have to worry about everything going home. But if you're doing a campaign, like all of your actions seem that much important because you're building towards this overall strategy. And so just overall having a really great time with Don going back to the Bayonets and Tomahawks campaign. Nice. And the little scenarios are fun. Don't get me wrong. Like the whole game as a whole is just good stuff. But uh, campaign and Bayonets and Tomahawks is good stuff. All right. Uh, and like I said, other than Rally the Troops action – and our featured game, I've been playing anything else. So yeah. go ahead and usually take I don't away. talk about Rally of the Troops or BGA games, but sure. in this case, I'm going to just because it's new for me. Um, but I've been playing a lot of Memoir 44 with Patrick. We've been nice. playing pretty much constantly for the last three weeks, just starting over and you know playing a, both sides and then doing a new scenario. And um, I had played it before, um, and I had played Commands and Colors and. Uh, the World War One version and a, a few different versions, um, but I ha- so it's not totally new to me. But this is the most I've ever played it, and we're having a good time with it. I mean, it's not super deep or anything, but it's a it's definitely a fun game to play on BGA when I've got a few minutes during the workday. So we've been playing lots of that one. Nice, yeah. Commands and Colors is always fun, especially if you don't have to do like the setup. Like if you can just right. get out and sure. chuck some dice, it's it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and I will say that one of the cool things about having it on BGA is I don't know how many expansions there are for it, but sure. a bunch of them are included on BGA, so you can really see a very wide variety. I mean, we've played a lot of different scenarios, and 
they play really differently. I mean, some of them, we played one that was, um, it's like Germans against French partisans, I think. And the partisans could like do extra retreats and stuff. So, you know, they were hard to kill because they just kept running away and it was really interesting. So it's, it's fun seeing the different expansions that I certainly don't have access to here. Or have to sort if you did have them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get your tackle boxes. Uh, another game I just started playing is The Greatest Day. This is Grand Tactical Series, uh, Sword Juno and Gold Beaches. We're going to be playing this multiplayer at Donkey Kong coming up, so we actually started playing online. And I just I did my initial uh, beach invasion, which went horribly. Mm-hmm. Um, but the system is really cool. I like it. Um, it's It's not crazy complicated. I mean, it's in depth, and there's lots of cool chrome and everything but it's not ridiculously hard to grok or anything like that um and i actually have um operation mercury that i got in one of those big super sales from uh mmp i got it for like 25 bucks a couple years ago it's still in the shrink but now that i've had a chance to play the the series it makes me want to get it out so i'll probably be doing that sometime next year um gts seems really good i like it so far GTS is fantastic. My problem with GTS is I've never stuck with it. And then yeah. so now anytime I go back to it, it's like, oh, well, I need someone to reteach me because I really don't want to go through the rule book yeah. in so much detail again. Um, and it's just not – to me, it, it's never felt like a just like a pick up and mm-hmm. go type of thing. I don't know. Yeah. Is it yeah, OCS? I, I think or, GTS is great. Is it OCS or BCS that has a Normandy game coming up? I can't remember which one. Uh, I don't know. One of the two has a has a Normandy game coming out, which I'm looking forward to. It. Well, OCS has like 20 games in the works, but they're all in varying states. So right. if, if if it is OCS, I wouldn't be surprised. Okay. Well, in any case, I mean, it's it's a fun Normandy invasion game. I mean, I've only played the invasion so far, but it's actually makes the invasion interesting. There's been other Normandy games I've played where um, it's basically just assumed that the invasion takes place and it's more about the breakout. Um, this one actually makes the invasion interesting and fun with decisions during the invasion even. so. Um, and then the other game um, I've been playing with Don, we just started playing uh, Next Door Iran. So only a couple turns into that one so far, but... Early indications, this is my favorite next war game. It's really cool. Um, it's it's different. Um, it's very asymmetrical. The Iranians have missiles that are hidden. You have to find them and destroy them. But um, the U.S. and the Allies don't have a whole lot of ground troops. So you're using air power and missiles a lot, which, you know, it's 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 interesting. It, it feels very different from the other games so far, and I'm really enjoying it. We're going to be playing more next month. Wow. Mm-hmm. High praise. Yeah, I mean, this will definitely be on P500 yep. for me. Very good. All right, well, that's that's it for games on the table. Yeah, that's it. I that guess got to be our fastest. <laughs> should, should we stall for time? <laughs> yeah. You can play some time kill music. <laughs> no, All right, well, we've got a game we can play, can't we? Kind of. Mm. Rich. You're mixing it up on me. I am. And if we can always go back to the war game game, as I'm dropping <laughs> cards left and right. All right. So the war game game always takes hours and hours of prep and research, <laughs> and well, then I have to play test the games to really make sure I know what I'm talking about when I when I come up with <laughs> rhymes and, and such. Uh, so an easier approach for yours truly. Did you happen to catch my interview with uh, Mr. Paul Shorefight? Yes, I did. Oh, are we going to play Trivial Pursuit? Yeah, come on <laughs> down. So. <laughs> All right, there's the first coughing fit of the night. All right, here we go. Yeah, so for those who didn't listen, uh, we have a show called Deserted Island Dads. And it's it's just a, a chat and hang out with good people. And we talk about what games we'd watch, watch the shore with. And uh, Paul chose an interesting one. Maybe not what you would expect from someone who plays war games and train <laughs> games. Uh, he chose Trivial Pursuit. But spe- specifically um, the Genus Edition. The old blue box. And not Genus 2 or 3 or 4. They've redone it. The 1980-something original. So naturally I found a copy in Shrink. Um, my pie pieces are still on the sprues. They have not been clipped with a, count, a corner nice. rounder yet. Uh, so I have three cards for you. Okay. You have, I'll give you 
two options. You can either take um, one card in its entirety, or you can take two categories from all three cards. For example, you could take history. I was going to try to remember what the categories are. Arts and entertainment is pink, right? Uh, yeah, entertainment. Um, G is geography, I believe. There was a cheat sheet, but I don't have it in front of me. Let's go with one card. I'm okay, gonna, one every card. Category. All right, one, two, or three. Uh, card number three. Okay. Oh, this is a super easy history question. Excellent. Okay. Starting from the top, what country is named for a line of latitude that runs through it? Ecuador. Nice. All right. That's a what? that's a history question. No, no, no. That was, oh, that was you wanted one one entire card, right? Okay. That was geography. Got it. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you the category. That's too easy. <laughs> what TV series featured Corporal Rocco Barbella? Oh man, that, 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 no way I'd get this one. Hill Street Blues. No, I'm just trying that, to think of old TV shows. Seems like a good guess to me, but no, the Phil Silver Show. Oh my gosh, I've never even heard of that. I bet I bet Mitch got it. <laughs> Uh, what war ended with an armistice signed at, at the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th Ooh, that's month? a tough one. I know, right? Um, that's got to be the, uh, what was the one we talked about last time? Like the Brazil-Paraguay War or something? No, I'm going to go ahead and say the Great War, <laughs> World War I. You almost had me. You almost <laughs> had me. I was like, what? Um, what Greek slave wrote fables? Aesop? Yes. Nice. When do Bailey's beads appear in the sky? Ooh, that's a good one. Bailey's beads. Man, you got to really... Huh. You'll do at least 50% here, I bet. I'm going to say when... I don't know. That sounds like it might be a cloud formation. I'm going to say when the upper atmosphere is below freezing. I don't know. No, during a total solar eclipse. Oh, okay. That's right. I do know what those are now that you say that. Right. Now that you, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the best kind of it. trivia question is when you know it after you hear the answer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What cocktail do you concoct with whiskey, pickled herring? <laughs> no, no. What cocktail do you con- concoct with whiskey and sweet vermouth? I don't drink vermouth, so I'm not oh. sure what this oh, one dang. is. It's not an old fashioned. Is it, um, I don't know. What is that one? Uh, a Manhattan. Manhattan. No, I should have done that. I've had those before, but it's not my drink. So yeah, I don't order them. But yeah. uh, nice. Okay, well, fifty percent. So there's the benchmark. I guess. Okay. Well, um, I mean, an average war game game. I usually end up around five or so. So sure. I'll I guess tell it. us uh, we can do and we can switch too. So tell us what you prefer. I have two boxes of Trivial Pursuit Genus Edition cards <laughs> that I'll never use otherwise. Awesome. Or we can go back to the war game game. You um, let us know. You'll play when Frenchie shows up. That's right. Send him when we get together in February. We can uh, we can play around and and send him some jealous absolutely some picks. yeah Make him jealous. All right. Well, holy smokes! It's time. It's time already. It is time. I am so excited for this. Me this was too. a great. I am so glad that you pulled this off the show because really, I don't know if we'd be sitting here in December talking about Pacific War if you hadn't started pushing this around. Yeah, and really, I mean, you know, I got it with uh, in, when the big box came from sure. GMT earlier this year. I think I got Into the Woods, Pacific War, Vietnam, and I think I had something else come too. But. You know, I looked at all of them, and I'm I'm a big naval guy, and I just thought, I've heard all this stuff about Pacific War. I want to open it up, try it out, see if I like it. And it just instantly hooked me. I mean, I couldn't, you know, every month, it's like, I try to take it off my table. I'm like, no, I want to play this one some more. So, I mean, I really, I played this game most of this year. And then, Good. Um, yeah, played through, uh, like, all of the, you know, the, the quicker the battle and the engagement scenarios and everything. And actually it wasn't until um, last month that I started doing the campaign scenario. I had sort of played around with it a little bit, just like to kind of figure out how it worked. But the first time I actually played it through was the last few weeks. So, and I played the Guadalcanal campaign, which I love. Nice. Well, let's backtrack just a little bit. Um, We've mentioned the name and that's Pacific War. Uh, originally released in 1985, but recently re-released, as Rich said, by GMT Games in 2022, designed by Mark Herman. And Pacific War is a... 
it, it's it's interesting. I think <laughs> I'm going to, to agree it, yeah. with Mark Herman here. It is not a strategic game. It is an operational game yep. with strategic scenarios that cover the whole war, but the, the, the focus of Pacific War, obviously, is Pacific War of World War II, covering basically everything from Pearl Harbor through 1945. And there's this note in the book that I highlighted, and I, th- I think it sums up everything so perfectly, is it's a game system that lets you take these 30 different scenarios and situations, there's 34, from the Pacific World War II and, and play them out, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there is a massive war strategic scenario, but that's going to be carried out on the operational scale scale like you're going to handle operation from operation while you play over those four and a half years or whatever and even if you play the campaign scenarios it's still a series of operations yeah yeah because you're going to play you're basically going to play it three weeks at a time more or less because that's sort of the default length of an operation you can go shorter or you can go longer but seems like most of them end up being about three weeks pacific war is known for its girth yeah it's a it's a it's a big game but again i'm gonna i'm gonna pull from mark herman here it's a monster game in the sense of components but unless you're talking about the strategic game like my takeaway and we did the malaya campaign and and played through that and we're actually gearing up next week this wednesday we're starting the 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 whole thing the whole strategic war yeah nice it's a monster game in the sense of how much stuff is in the box and how long I think the strategic game is going to play. But I'd say two thirds of the design intent isn't meant to be a monster in like my eyes. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and, and I think like the biggest selling point to me is that like, if I want to play, if you ask me what my favorite Guadalcanal game is, it's the Pacific war, but that's just like one small part of everything that's in the box. I mean, I can take, one small map that's not even as big as one of the two mounted maps. And I can take, I mean, it's probably 30, 40 counters total once you pick them all out. And I can play the Guadalcanal campaign. And it's my absolute favorite Guadalcanal campaign, Guadalcanal game. And that's just a part of everything that's in the box. Yeah, I I think it's a great aspect of this game is the scalability of, if you want to scale up to Guadalcanal or scale down to, you know, just... I don't you know pick a pick a battle scenario if you want to you can there's so much flexibility built in the the box and so I don't even know if someone if someone came to you and said what is what is Pacific War what is Pacific War about like I have in my mind how I would describe it um but I think maybe that's the next place we should go is to you. What is what is specific for? I mean, it's a yeah. war game. Yeah, I mean, I would say it is a game that can cover a wide variety of scales about World War II in the Pacific. Yeah, and I think it does that through this interesting concept as, as we like zoom in a little bit closer of how time is handled through the game, mm-hmm. how resources are handled through the game, and there's there's. I want to talk about how eventually all the little great things are like about the game, but generally speaking, once you move past like the engagement scenarios where you're really just taking the rules and bite sized pieces, like, all right, here's how, uh, you know, bombing runs against naval targets works, which is really what the first engagement is. Mm-hmm. You don't move anything, you just do combat. Once you start moving past that, and maybe you do some battle scenarios which are fun. I like the battle scenarios that I've messed around with, but really I think you get the meat of the game and the campaign stuff yeah. is you start to see this concept of using your resources to commit troops for a certain amount of time. Um, and I've completely lost where my train of thought were go- was going with that point, but I think that's a core aspect of at least a quarter of the game. Sure. I think I know where you're going with it because it's not just troops, but it's um, it's your naval units as well, too. Because yeah. um, especially in the campaign scenarios, you're given a number of operations points and you spend right. them to activate ships. So, you know, I, I'll, 
I'll just use the Guadalcanal scenario as my example. I've got a whole lot of ships. I've got like three carriers and a million destroyers and cruisers and airplanes all over the place and everything, but I don't have enough operational points to activate all of those. So what I have to do is I have to activate my headquarters and a small subset. And basically, you know, depending on the month and how many points you have, it might be a single task force. And you might be able to send those guys out. And then, like I said, you have to decide ahead of time how long they have to complete their mission before they have to come back to base. So there's a couple ways that's represented. One is because you basically buy your your three weeks or your four weeks. Everything is is basically done in weeks. So you could do one, two, three, or four weeks. But it it costs a lot more to do four weeks Mm -hmm. than it does to do three weeks. So if if your ships aren't back in port in 21 days, then the game punishes you for that by, you know, taking away future points and stuff like that. So, um, it, it, it makes sense because the, what it's trying to model is you just sent those ships out on a three week mission. They have three weeks of supplies. They have three weeks of everything that they need and they were gone for three and a half weeks and they're start, you know, you're, you basically thrown your headquarters into disarray by doing that. And then the ground troops, you also buy a certain number of weeks for them, but they call them battle cycles. And the way it works for them is basically if they have some horrendous combat losses, um, it's going to start chewing up their battle cycles more and more where they may not necessarily have to like, you know, go back to port or something like that, but say they're already on the ground, they're basically just going to have to stop until the next operation. Cause they can't really do anything else because they're out of supplies, out of command, all that stuff. So that's the way it manages the time is by forcing you to think ahead. And the first time you do a campaign scenario, if you're anything like me, you're going to screw that up because you're going to be at like right. day, you know, you've got a 21 day operation and you're at day 15 and you're like, yeah, I'm going to send these carriers to go bomb this Island one more time. You're like, Oh crap, I can't make it back to port in time. <laughs> so there's a there's a lot of learning just involved in making sure that you you follow the rules that the game has set up for you. Yeah, and you even get a little bit little bit of that in the battle scenarios. You don't have you don't buy the time. The, this yeah. whole concept that you have you just have a, a time schedule when you're doing a battle right. scenario. Uh, but you still have to deactivate your ships mm-hmm. in port. You can't in the scenario with your ships out in the middle of the ocean. And so that is like you do kind of walk through that stuff. I uh, I think maybe we just like as the game can scale up, maybe we zoom in. And one thing I was kind of surprised by when I first pulled this off the shelf and started going through it was you don't really have units on the map in any kind of way other than task forces and forces. Right. And so, like, you have this display where a lot of information isn't shared with the the other player. The game solos fine, but really, it I think it this whole concept of detection and stuff, we can get into that. Um, I was really, like... I don't know what I expected, but this this is, wasn't it. I expected like a very counter dense map, but it's actually not because all of your stuff is pulled off on on a display mm-hmm. and they're tucked under task force markers. Yeah, I know it's cool. Yeah, and then and I haven't had a chance to <coughs> play against anyone yet. Um, I actually had a game scheduled for earlier in December and ended up not having the time to. Well, we were going to play and we didn't have time to actually schedule it. So hopefully next year I'm going to play. Guadalcanal campaign against someone. Um, but yeah, it makes a big difference when you really don't know what's coming after you until you detect it. So, and there's yeah, a I'm... lot of, um, it, not only the detection as far as what the player can see, but there's a lot of detection as far as what in, in, in game as well. And there's intelligence yeah. conditions. Um, I mean, that's a huge aspect of the game is basically how, how well does the enemy force know what you're about to do because it completely changes how they can react to it. You know, the difference between ambush and surprise is, is just night and day. If you launch an operation into a surprise operation, the enemy is basically just going to have to take his licking. Whereas with an ambush operation, something like midway, if you've played that one in the battle scenarios, you get to move so much that you can, you can basically just lure them into your trap and sail around them and set them up for exactly what you wanted to do to them. Yeah, and I, I mean, it's it's not 
it, it is different, but it's not all that different from fleet in, right. especially on the naval side of things. If you want to take actions against naval forces, you have to you have to detect them. Mm-hmm. And I love, and this isn't like a big picture thing. Just mechanically, there's three different levels of detection. Um, and like with air, if if they're coming to to bomb an installation or whatever, once you detect them, you detect them. That's it. But with naval, depending on your level of success is the amount of information you share and the worst kind of detection you can fudge your numbers plus or minus 50 percent mm-hmm. and so I, that's such a great like well i have i have five there but is that does he really have you know three there does he really have yeah. seven there i have no idea and what a great there's so many things in this game like that that are I just I get so much delight from. I have a lot of frustrations with this rule book, but there are just so <laughs> many great design concepts. This this idea that air bases can only, you know, launch so many aircraft. What a little thing, but I don't know of another game that I've seen that in where I mean, I guess like to a certain extent OCS like you're limited to how much resupply you can do, but I I don't know. There's yeah. there's so much of that all throughout this game that every time I read the rule, I just think Holy crap, that is awesome. Yeah, you can load up an airbase with planes, but if yeah. that if they get raided by another air force, um, you can't launch them all. And the guys sitting on the ground are absolute sitting ducks. Yep. Even worse if you don't detect them. <laughs> While we're on the topic of like surprises, you know, I mentioned the lack of counters on them. There's still plenty of counters on the map, don't get me wrong. But your whole force is not represented on the map at one time. Just movement itself is very procedural and very slow, but it's when you're when you're dealing with a map of that scale and then you're dealing with like a two two day by two day basis, like you're reflecting their movement over a period of two days essentially. Mm-hmm. I I also didn't really expect that. I mean, for the most part, your ships are moving, you know, two hexes d- depending on the phase. And a lot of that goes to intelligence conditions as well, because basically the operating player can move his ships basically until he's detected. And then depending on what the intelligence condition is, the the other player will be able to react. So they might be able to move his ships just as far or not as all or even twice as far. So. um, Yeah, there's this whole there's this whole like different phase of once you go into once you engage you move into this battle cycle phase, which mm-hmm. then, you know, changes how time and movement right. is handled differently. And you're talking about the rule book that, actually, I mean, I don't know anywhere in the rule book and I'm sure it's in there somewhere, but where in the rule book does it say that once you make contact, you don't go back to these phases, you stay in the battle cycle, you know, stuff like that is, was definitely confusing in the rule book, but once yeah, you figure it's... it out, you're like, Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. It, it, I totally see why it is that way, but it wasn't clear that it is that way. Sure. Yeah. I don't, I think we'll get to it. Let's, I'm going to save that. So when we start, I do have some complaints about the game. I don't know how big or important they are. Um, you know, when I was, I was talking, I don't even remember which game it was. I was talking to our buddy Rex and is his point was, and for the most part, I think it's fair is, does a bad rule book warrant a critique of the game? And obviously it depends on the the level of, of bad rules, right. right? Like if it's I mean, I would say to some degree it does because right. um, when that game shows up on my, my doorstep, I have the game and I have the rule book. And my impressions of the game are going to be led to me from the rule book. So right. I'm not going to have Mark bad... here to teach me the game. Is it a bad game if the rules are bad? Probably, like, if you can work through it, then no, I don't think it is. Is it worth mentioning and if someone's going to, like, hey, it may be worth noting that the rulebook kind of sucks and you're going to have to do some legwork to get through it? I think that's worth mentioning. I don't think it's a knock against the game. This is a complete aside because the Pacific War rulebook, whatever complaints I have about it, are not bad. It's not a bad rulebook. I would do things way differently in a number of different ways. It's perfectly fine. Yeah. But... So, sorry for the <laughs> aside. I don't even know, like, what do you even... I'm trying to th- think of how we should tackle this game. And so, like, what are some of your favorite takeaways? Like, I talked about how there's these, like, little case rules that add so much flavor to the game with, like, air-based limitations and just how detection works. And 
So like what are what are some things you really like that you've seen in Pacific War so far? Um things that I love about the game are um I like the the obviously the naval detection and the uh the you know the the way the task forces are arranged into mm-hmm. screens and cores. Yes. Um so you know you've got your 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 carriers and then you've got your destroyers and your, your cruisers protecting them and you know you're you can depending on how you have them arranged and depending on the task force and everything, when it, when it comes to anti-air, you're going to sometime you're usually, you're going to use the screen, but you know, you might choose to use the core instead. Um, but yeah, air strikes are, are fun in this game. Yes. It's, there's a whole yep. procedure where you, you know, if they're detected, then they, they have to take flak and combat air patrol and then they get to do all their things. And um, the, uh, the, the combat results table is, is, nice it's elegant i mean it's one big table that covers everything and the really the thing i love about it the most is whatever your strength is you have to roll less than that so no matter what you can always look at it you can say i'm sitting in a three strength aircraft if i roll higher than a three i don't even have to look at it no matter what you're never going to get a result if you roll higher than your strength and then from there the combat results table you look at you know what you're attacking and what what you rolled and everything and you discern what your results are but it's a it's a big um but very yeah elegant table i think i agree 100 percent. i like all the different combat resolutions i've experienced yes agreed and even though like you mentioned the ordering of fleets like yeah that's great that you have the screen in the core then it didn't know it was going to be in here and mm-hmm. it makes total sense that it is um, I do like that it is again, yeah. just so much flavor is, is packed into this game. There's a lot of Chrome, but it's all Chrome that I like and appreciate it. Yeah. The counters are heavy with information, but not as much as second fleet. Um, Agreed. But the ships are, I mean, you know, they have the right amount of information where you can see, well, this is, you know, this is what it does as a bombard. And it's even got a B on there to remind you this, this guy bombards at a five or whatever. So it's pretty easy to find the information when you need it. It is pretty close to second fleet. It's funny you mentioned that <laughs> because I reference, I have to look that up all the time still. Uh, like what's, what's what? And yeah, you get it down, but yeah. Um, sequence of play is it's, it's in the rule book and it's on the, pl- the player aid chart if you follow it, but you're still going to want to spend a lot of time in the rule block, like looking up specifically what everything does. So, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know why that is one of the aspects of this game that I've struggled most with is just, I know like you're right. It's right there on your screen and you just you tick it along tick 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 do this do this do this but i am like where is the deep like you need a breakout and it's on it's like in the middle or early middle part of the rule book and mm-hmm. really nitpicky here but you need you need the next war sequence of play in this game yes you need absolutely. that handout a hundred percent that would be so nice yep and if you did a, a next war sequence of play with rule references on it that would be amazing it really would. It would go such a long way. There mm-hmm. are, um, I shouldn't say a million. I shouldn't be hy- hyperbolic here when <laughs> we're reviewing it. There are, I think, a lot of quality of life improvements that you could implement into the rules. And I think what we just mentioned is could be one of the most helpful ones. Yeah. Is a player aid card that is a detailed sequence of play. Yep. The game is also a table hog, for sure. Um, yeah. because, yeah. and it's not even the map. I mean, I'm playing Guadalcanal, which is a relatively small map, but I still have, you need at least one full, it's got the sequence of play and the, the, the numbers chart and everything on there. You need at least one of those. And depending on how you play, you might need two. You need at least one for each side of a forces display. Um, so there's a lot that you need on the table that doesn't even include the map. So it's definitely a table hog. Sure is. Sure is. What, I don't, what else do you feel? What do you feel we need to mention about this game? What do we be? What disservice would we? And I'm saving the comparison to outside of comparing the Empire of the Sun. What do you think our listeners should know about this game that we haven't touched on yet? Um, I think the thing that that really blows me away the most is 
how wide a scale it f- it really feels like it accurately represents. You know, everything down from, I mean, the attack on Pearl Harbor is, is 15 minutes. We're just rolling some dice and stuff like that. But, you know, you can do the Guadalcanal campaign, um, which is going to take, you know, hours to days to play, depending on how long you take. You can play, you know, the the land campaigns in, uh, you know, the, the, the Melee Peninsula and stuff like that. You can, you can do all the island hopping. You can do everything that you would conceivably want to do in the Pacific War. You can do naval battles. You can do airstrikes on bases. You can do all of that stuff all within this one game, which just, I mean, honestly, that just, that impresses the hell out of me. Yeah. I agree. I like every aspect I've seen in the game. When you mentioned you can do naval battles, you can do land battles, whatever your flavor. I like them all. Yeah. I think what I like the most so far, I'm very interested to see how we do with the the strategic, but I am excited to to get it underway. But I really like these open, these open water naval engagements. Yeah, those are fun to play too. The naval bat, the naval gunnery battles are fun to play. What's the first um, battle scenario? Um, oh, is it the Wake um, Island, Savo Island. Uh, maybe I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking of Wake Island. So we played Wake Island and yeah. we only did a little, we only played through a few turns of it, but just this, this feeling, you know, we always talk about how do games make us feel. And, and even though the battle scenario, that's not like the most super detailed one or whatever. We have these, you know, you have this U S and we played four player. And so we had this U S you know, Naval commander over here moving his ships in and, and this other naval commander's over here doing it obviously but we're just in the middle of nowhere in this great big blue ocean and we're all just trying to detect each other and it just feels like mm-hmm. what i want a pacific war at this scale to feel like yep. it's just like fleet in that sense um you know when we talked about second fleet and seventh fleet for whatever reason i like this stuff out in the open we're, when we played the malaya campaign it's it's fun but I haven't done a whole lot as the Brits there because the, well, quite frankly, it doesn't go well for the Brits. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's fine. It's still interesting to me to see how things play out. I do think I like the naval stuff a whole lot more so far than the land stuff. But yeah, it's definitely geared toward that. Sure. Yeah. But the naval, the naval stuff just feels good. It feels Mm -hmm. right. The air stuff feels right. You have to fly out and come back, you know, the air base thing uh, you have, carriers and just crawling around the ocean trying to find each other it all just feels good yeah and i think i i said this a few months ago when i was talking about pacific war but um the one the one other sort of enduring impression i have is that yes the rule book can be hard to follow and it's hard to figure these things out sometime but with possible one minor exception every time like a rule has been explained to me on on bgg or whatever I've always come away saying, oh yeah, that makes sense. It, it yep. just, it, it fits the game. It fits the, the scenario. Yes, of course it works that way, which I like, you know, I'm not coming away from going, okay, well that's the rule, but it seems really stupid to me. <laughs> I agree a hundred percent. I've had several of those. I'm cursing Mark Herman <laughs> and while well, we're flipping through the rule book. And then when we get it, it's like, oh, and at first, sometimes it's like, well, why the hell is it this way? Yeah. And then you start to think about it, and it's like, well, shit, actually, when you think about that, that actually makes a lot of sense. And then so, there's been instances where I check the rule book. I was like, well, this this is dumb. Why would this ever be the case? And there's one or two times where that has been errated out. Mm-hmm. But the other times, I start to chew on it, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. And my like my takeaway is one Obviously, you and I both feel passionately about this game. I think it's clear that we both really enjoy it. But holy hell, is it very frustrating at times. But then once it's no longer frustrating, it's it's not elegant in the design because sometimes there are all these hurdles to like get... There are problems you have to work through, I think. Um, at least that's been my experience. But once you get to the solution and you figured out how the rule actually works... Uh, it's very satisfying. And so it's a frustrating, frustratingly satisfying game. Yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely, 
and I mean, this is my experience as I was playing it all summer long, but the more I play it, the more I want to play it. Yeah. Yes. I yeah, haven't had the, a game hook me like this in a while. <laughs> yeah. The more we peel back, it's like, oh, yeah, I want to see that in action now. Yeah. Or like I start reading ahead in the rules like when we first, you know, you do the you do the Pearl Harbor thing, whatever. And then I was like, well, I should do some more of this. But then we decided to hop online, um, our, our four-player group, Rex, Paul, and, and Carl. And I threw this out there. I was like, hey, the Vassal module supports four players. We should uh, – we should – do this oh nice i didn't even and, and so that. we started we started pushing things around but then it's like oh i want to see the next thing and then because at first i was like i don't know if i'm ready to do a battle and then you know it's like come on balls deep <laughs> let's let's do this and so we start doing that and then once you dive in you're right i just want more and more of it and i take on you know we did a little bit of the battle and then we jumped into the malaya campaign and it's like well let's just go for it and sure i don't necessarily recommend that because you know, we're taking on all kinds of water trying to work through it, and we did, but, man, when we did, then it's like, all right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing I can understand and master because uh, this game is extremely rewarding um, in a lot of different aspects? Again, I really like the naval stuff yeah. a lot. Any negatives for the, that stand out to you? Yeah, I think the rule book, particularly when you're learning the game. What about in the game itself? Oh, and the game itself and the game design itself. Um, that's a good question. I would say for me, if there is one, it might be submarines. Submarines are probably the oh, most yeah. abstracted thing in the game. Um, and they, they kind of feel like they were thrown as an afterthought. So, you know, you can buy them for points. So you can use them for searching, which is nice. You can make a couple attacks with them, but they just kind of feel weird. So they feel different from the rest of the game, I think is the best way I would describe it. A little bit of this may be cleared up once we do the strategic game and I have a more active role in land stuff. Yeah. Um, because even in my solo stuff, I haven't done the land-based stuff. And in Malaya, I'm just... Like, my command is so limited that I'm not going to activate it on, you know, a garrison unit that's going to get obliterated. Sure. Right? Like, I'm going to hope he gets booted out of there and has to retreat on his own. Why would I spend resources on him? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm not getting quite as much satisfaction out of the land stuff, but again, that'll probably hopefully change once I take a more active command. It doesn't like, you know, reading through the rules and I understand how it works. It's not like, ah, this is bad. It's just like I'm I'm just not doing a lot of land things yeah. yet. Yeah, and most of the land stuff I have is well, Gorda Canal. So it's it's like a naval invasion, and they're never actually moving on the land. They just you know embark on and do the invasion and the battles, sure. and then follow up with the fighting after that. Um, I love the map layout. I am not a fan of the map art at all. Yeah. yeah. It's different. The layout is different. Like the first time I like I put the layout the game on the table. I'm like, oh. This is a whole new perspective. You're you're looking at it basically from America's point of view, so that's different. Also, label your maps. I don't care that there's two <laughs> of them. When you say map A or map B, they need to be labeled. Yeah, I'm s <laughs> like, it's especially when you have a confusing layout. It's not just a picture of the Pacific Ocean, right? Like, and I know that's a nitpicky thing that shouldn't dissuade you at all from buying this game. I never even on, noticed label that, your maps. but sure, <laughs> I did right away because I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> Because I was getting ready for Pacific War, and I was like, well, I'm going to get some stuff out and, like, get it out so as I read the rules, like, I can kind of see it represented. And it's like, get out map B or something. I don't even remember anymore. And then so I'm like, well, which which one's map B? <laughs> you know? <laughs> A little thing. But I, I don't like the map art. And it's not like, eh, it's just not for me. I just don't like the graphic representation. Again, I love the layout. I find it super interesting. But just the graphic choice for the maps, just not not my taste. I would, of course, much rather see like a Seminich or something like that a map. That's a personal thing, but it was right away like my first takeaway. It was like, nope, not, not my taste. <laughs> there is just a lot of just like paper shuffling, right? Like, where is that? Sure. Until you really get familiar with it. Like, yeah. where is that represented? And the uh, the U.S. and the Japanese charts are, are different, at least yep. for the search they are. So you need mm -hmm. both of them, um, which is cool because they had different capabilities. But it also means, even as a solo player, it's one more thing you got to keep track of. And actually, on that side, it doesn't say whether it's U.S. or Japanese. you got to flip it over. So 
Oh, really? Like on the search chart, it, I don't think it says Japanese search. I think you got to flip it over to see that it's the Japanese one. So, but you know, that's a minor thing. I I do know people that have um, made like a, just a two sided search chart with the graphic on there because that's the thing that you're going to use the most. That in the sure. CRT. I played other than Pearl Harbor on Vassal and I just kept switching sides because okay. I was like I if I want to be realistic about how much I can get to the table and you know, little paws running around <laughs> um, there's no way that you know yeah. a three year old isn't going to you know knock some of this around so um, I even then there was still a lot of paper shuffling but there is a like a yeah 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 this game is a table hog on Vassal too like it's almost it yeah. too big to manage on Vassal so and and, and, uh, it's, and again, it's not just because of the map. It's because of how many different other things you need besides the map. I know that everyone learns differently, but my biggest complaint with the game by far is, is the rules, especially when you're doing the engagement. The engagement scenarios, that's like the Pearl Harbor we're talking about, where you, you just you fire at Pearl Harbor and you ones, attack yeah. with planes, right? Roll, 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 roll. There's so much rules explained before you even get to Pearl Harbor, and it doesn't need to be. Because what Pearl Harbor is, is getting you familiar with the combat results table. Yeah. What And look, Mark Harmon's success is noted, and he's a fantastic game designer, and this was a design choice. But when I have something like Buffalo Wings or speed of heat or i'm trying to think of something other than <laughs> something from that series that takes the rules and says okay here's how combat resolution works stop and do this that is to me how the engagement scenario rulebook should have been laid out so if you're unfamiliar there's actually three Unconditional rulebooks. surrender does a good job of that there you go so there's three rule books for a pacific war and there is a battle and engagement rule book the two easiest modes of playing those rule books are just the core rule books with rules pulled out. Yeah. And if you open so up the, the core rule book, it says, if you're new to this game, put this down and pick up the battle rule book instead. Which is fine. Yeah. Great. I like that they did that. But I even think that's so, a... like you said, it doesn't teach you how to play the game. It's still a lot of rules. Right. Here's the problem with the engagement rules is there's still so much stuff packed into the battle rule book um, that it's kind of like you go set up Pearl Harbor and it's a little unclear where you even start. And so if I'm going to learn the rules, one, I think that's a much in a game like this. If you have a separate rule book for doing that, I think that's a better approach, which yeah. is fine. That's my personal taste. That's not a valid critique of the rules as a whole. I just feel like, you know how I tend to say the rules aren't that bad. There's just a lot of them <laughs> like with next war, right? Yeah. Like, if you read the next four rules, they make sense. Like, there's a lot, if, but if you go read the strike rules, you're going to know how to play the game. I don't know. Like, that's just not the case here. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to go read the activation rules. Or, <clears throat> like, the when you're spending points to yeah. activate for an I operation. I think I would disagree to some degree. Because well, it it, it, well, I think so it depends on the rule, about, Rich. Like, I think, like you said, about a third of the way into the rule book. Now, again... I'm not saying this is the best way to do it, but about a third of the way into rulebook, there is a sequence of play. And in that sequence of play, you can go and you can say, okay, this is the strike phase. I need to look up rule 20 or whatever, and it'll tell me how to do an airstrike. And there's even in the rulebook, there's even a little yeah. diagram in there that shows how it works. So I think it's all there. Um, it I, is all it's there. Not, it's not laid out the best maybe, but I, I think it's there. No, okay, fine. I agree. You're you're right. But that's that's not you can't apply that to the whole rule book. And I think that's my biggest problem is this this whole aspect of of buying time and who gets to activate and who gets to activate time when like there's this whole concept of like if you are the reacting player and you don't activate your troops mm -hmm. well, because you can't move them but then you do choose to activate them like you're you're spending zero points so you put like a start marker but then your start marker is done so you can buy like you start and end on the same day uh, that is a terrible explanation of the rule but technically that's how it ha that's how it's happened but you find that on page 3 of BGG 
And so some of the core aspects of this game I don't think are clear or particularly well written or I just really struggle with them. You're right. If I go look up do airstrikes, it is very clear. That is a particular rule where you read through it. It's just another rule. It's not overly complicated. But there are some very complex rules and the rules explanation are buried on online and i don't know i no, I, I just think yeah, it's, it's worth it's, mentioning it's not always clear um and for me personally i did a lot of my learning by watching some pretty good youtube videos yeah so yeah and i agree Same that here. combined with a rule book and combined with looking up stuff as i went through it is how i learned how to play it right and again this is a an phenomenal game it it really is it's it's yeah. going to be near the top of the list i mean i will say and and this obviously pacific war is a very different game from Caverna or something like that. But Euro games and, you know, Rodney who teaches the games. I mean, that's like the best way to learn a new game is to watch Rodney teach you how to play this game. And I think he might've actually done a couple light war games, but nobody's really doing that for Pacific war. Well, sure. But then it's also like, I, I actually, in most rules do not like rules videos. That's neither here nor there. I, I think my whole point of this is our, if, if someone's sitting at home and they're like, should I get Pacific War? And for some reason, they're going to listen to our advice. <laughs> and, and the advice from me is, yes, you should get it. I think it's worth noting that the rules in certain cases are a real dog. Yeah. And then just as a whole, I find a lot of frustration. I wish I could call back to specific. Uh, the one instance I'm particularly thinking of is that the start and end for the reacting player on the same day if you don't activate troops. Again, don't don't worry about me explaining that. There's just a lot of frustration I've had with the rule book. And I I don't even know specifically what it is, but I mean it's thirty seven years old. you there's been thirty seven years to to yeah. make this so, the, the best game. And it's pretty close, Rich. It's real close and I'm nitpicking here. But yeah. I feel I and, also feel like there's missed opportunities. And, and there were a lot of people in the last year that have said that in that it's a great game. It's 37 years old. Why couldn't the rules be better? Sure. Yeah. I don't and have an again, answer to that question. So and I don't think Mark Herman has to give an answer to that question. <laughs> I'm not asking him to. I think it's totally fine. But look, look, mom. If you're thinking about buying this for me, one, I already have a copy and Christmas is over, so no. But that's a, that's a valid concern, I think. It, but once you work through it, again, it's frustrating. Obviously, I'm, I'm getting worked up over for no reason because it doesn't matter. I'm going to keep playing this game. It's so good. Um, and when you work through that frustra- str- frustration, then it's brilliant. It really is. <laughs> but... Yeah. And I think Man, it's worth I've it to even ask it. yourself, like, I mean, I feel pretty confident that I know how to play this game, but if I were to sit down with someone who is brand new to it and think about teaching them in this game, you know, that's, that's a big hurdle. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I would probably take a similar approach that Mark Herman suggests. I certainly wouldn't throw them in the campaign, but I'd probably <laughs> say, Hey, here's, here's Pearl Harbor. Here's something you probably know. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to see how airplanes work out. I'm not even, I'm not going to explain task forces, you know, like that battle rule book. Like you go through all these rules about forces and task forces and, and all this stuff. If you're going to have a separate rule book, pull all that crap out and order it in the order of the engagement scenarios. Sorry, rant ran over <laughs> because it doesn't matter, right? Like this is a brilliant game. Would you agree? Oh yes, I would agree. It's a brilliant game. We'll, okay, we'll get, get we'll get back to that. <laughs> yeah. So first off, I know what you're drinking, but I know you have a perfectly paired drink for this. So uh, let's go drink rec. Well, first off, what are you drinking, and what is your drink recommendation for Pacific War? So I'm drinking a sink pack, and I think that's the perfect game for this. So a sink pack is a, a it's a drink actually invented by Admiral Nimitz and um, Chesty Nimitz, yeah, as which, those close to him like to refer. Yeah, to him his as. his best friends always called him that. Um, <laughs> So it's it's basically an old fashioned with rum added to it. I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's the basics of it. Yeah, it's good good stuff. Um, I don't even think we talked about the setting, but this I guess we did briefly. Uh, recommended reading. I'm gonna take this because I'm in the <laughs> middle of it, and I think we're gonna agree. Uh, the first one has got to be Ian Toll's Pacific sure. Cru- yep. Crucible. 
And how are you coming on that? I know you were working on it. I finished. Oh my up. gosh, the first book is so good. Yeah, it's I'm fantastic. probably three quarters through it. Um, I will be. We talked about this, but I'll be sad when when Grover Cleveland is is no longer in my ear. <laughs> um, yeah. What if? Yeah. I you know I own this book and then I returned it and then I went back and forth because you know if you ask uh, what's his name. If you ask Bruce Garrick his thoughts on the book, like, oh my gosh, no one's committed a bigger sin than Ian Toll in oh, our really? world. I, I yeah, I, yeah. Hearing him talk about that. Yeah, I think he really doesn't like how it doesn't deal with Burma in any kind of meaningful way. Um, um and they, so far you know, it, it hasn't. That in either the second or third book. Oh really? They'll okay, so They'll so far it, he yeah. hasn't touched on it. So I don't know if I, I could be misquoting him, but I think that was his his yeah. complaint. Yeah, they spend a significant time on either the second or third book. I can't remember which. One. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, so far it's not present. So, anyways, um, but f- it took me a long time to get around to it be- because of that. And I was like, well, maybe that's not the World War Pacific World War II book I want to read. Uh, it's it's fantastic. It's yeah. so well written. Um, another one. It's I read it a while ago. It's called Eagle Against the Sun. That's another good one. Um, it's not short by any means, but it's nowhere near the length of the Toll Trilogy either. So um, maybe a little more approachable. That's also a very good book about the Pacific War. Not explicitly about the Pacific War, but largely. Um, and it's where Chesty and I first got <laughs> uh, acquainted with each other. And that's The Admirals by Walter oh, yeah, sure. uh, Borneman. I love that book. It really is just one of my favorite history books Um, And that's covering Nimitz, Halsey, Leahy, and King. And they were all the five-star admirals. And so, obviously, you get some European uh, Atlantic Ocean stuff. But I would recommend that just for the um, extra detail on on the Pacific admirals. And there's a – I mean, obviously, there's tons of good books about – smaller specific parts of the war as well. So Yeah, Yeah. Helmet for My Pillow and – with the old breed, like if you want na- uh, land stuff yeah. in the Pacific, yeah, oh, those are phenomenal. Yeah, <clears throat> I read Tin Can Titans earlier this year. That was a good oh, one yeah. too, specifically about destroyers. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a great a great list. And uh, Helmet for My Pillow and With the Old Breed are both oh, yeah. like short, yeah. like they're not long reads at all. And those are what formed uh, the Pacific, the HBO show. Yeah, they were the basis for that. Nice. Before we we have a couple of listener some questions. Important listener questions that we have to get. Well, to. yeah. So <laughs> Patrick's we're gonna save, but um, the the real ones. Not that Patrick's question is not real. It exists in in a sense. But the ones specifically pertaining to Pacific War, I want to get to, and then I'll, I'll just so you're braced because um, you have to do all the heavy lifting on it. Is the questions we got from from Bruce and Tom about the comparison to Empire of the Sun. Yeah. But uh, let's start with Tom's first question, which was how or and or which campaign would you recommend to start in Pacific War? How would you try to teach Pacific War to others? Yeah, so we've covered this a little bit, teaching Pacific War for others. Um, I, I, I'm not going to say you have to go through every battle scenario and every engagement scenario, no. but look at what they cover. I mean, obviously, starting with Pearl Harbor is a great first scenario because it's it's 15 minutes and all you're doing is rolling dice. And then the the like the Wake Island one is good. And then, you know, just look at some different aspects and go, yeah, I want to see how this part of the game works. Um, but work your way through those, not necessarily doing all of them, but some of them. Um, and I think that will give you an idea of how the pieces start to fit together. For the campaign scenario, I would start with Guadalcanal um, because it's it's on the the smaller map, the ex, ex, map A extended, which is a it's smaller than either of the two halves of the mounted maps. Um, it's it's fairly low counter density. Um, it's not super long. If you want to play a campaign scenario, I would definitely recommend that one. Yeah, nice. I mean, I I talked about just kind of taking some of the information portrayed in the engagement scenarios, and you don't even play Pacific or gosh, don't even play Pearl Harbor, but just set it up like, yeah. okay, here's, here's the fleet. I see do that on fast points. because it's going right. to take you longer to pull the counters out than it will right. to, set it, to play the game. And then I would, I would just kind of pull out some core mechanics, you know, run them. Maybe you run them through a battle cycle because once you, once you start an operation alluding to Rich's earlier question, comment, um, is the battle cycle will run until that operation is done. 
So having the battle cycle down pat is and understanding what each phase is and when you can detect and that kind of stuff, I think get some core mechanics. How do searches work? How does how do you resolve combat? Um, what's the strike phase? Those types of things. That's going to teach you that. And then do something where you can run through a battle cycle, such as the like the Wake Island battle deal. And start with those battle scenarios, I think. Nice. Uh, thanks for the question, Tom. And then Mitch had a great question, I thought, is assuming you both you have both noticed that you can see the bones of Pacific War informing the mechanics of Empire of the Sun. I haven't. I haven't played Empire of the Sun. Which game bo- best showcases the intricacies of naval warfare in the Pacific? Which do you prefer and why? I'm going to let you take this sure. one. But, man, what I will say is Empire of the Sun has a very high bar to reach because the naval warfare as presented in Pacific War is probably, for me, outside of submarines, because I do agree with you there, for air and surface ships as good as fleet. Yeah, so... Yeah, I don't think there's any question which one is the better game and which one handles naval warfare in general better. Um, yes, you can see the bones, particularly in the operations. So they do them very differently in Pacific War. You're getting a cer- given certain number of command points that you have to spend to activate groups. Um, in Pacific War, it's a card-driven game. So you have a card um, that will give you a certain number of points or if you take the event on the card, then it'll often give you more points to activate more guys and enter your operations that way. But they both have the same basic idea to them. Um, I would say the, the, the big difference is in Empire of the Sun, the focus is on control of the skies. Um, Empire of the Sun is, is all about taking air bases, um, having planes based in bases so that you can knock out supply lines and detect enemy operations and things like that. Um, whereas Pacific War is, um, Empire of the Sun feels more gamey, um, in that you're trying to, uh, you know, put, put those, those radii of aircraft over as much space as possible. Whereas Pacific War, it feels like you're actually, um, you're actually operating in a real world environment more so to take strategic ground, not because you're trying to put a circle of air power over a certain place, but because you're trying to um, move your forces in a certain way. They're similar, um, but different in that respect. I would say uh, Empire of the Sun feels more gamey. Pacific War feels more realistic. Yeah, that probably gets to uh, the question of Bruce, Bruce which was, and just comparisons between Pacific War and Empire of the Sun. Do you think that, just based off what I do know of Empire of the Sun, does Empire of the Sun feel like the more strategic game, like in the sense of strategic scale? I mean, that's one of those, and the question came up on Discord again this week, what defines those things. But sure, right. to me, strategic means you get to decide what is produced. And, and that's not a hard and fast description. That's solely my description. But in neither of these games do you ever get to decide what is produced. You're both always just given a reinforcement schedule. Um, there are, I mean, there's like a political willpower track in Empire of the Sun that you have to deal with. But really, that's just an abstraction that the Japanese are trying to drive down to zero to kick the U.S. out of the war. So I wouldn't say either game is, in my opinion, strategic. I'd call them both like grand operational. Okay. Um, if someone came up to, so then I think this would be a question, uh, that I can't answer, but I think it's probably a common question that people are going to have because Empire of the Sun is one of the like most well-reviewed and often recommended GMT and war games, you know, anything in the family, uh, recommended. Someone came to you and they said, Hey, I'm, I'm an experienced war gamer, but I've never touched anything in the Pacific theater so my point is they're not necessarily worried about difficulty uh, and they say I, what, what should i get i would say pacific war because of the range of scale that you can do you can do everything that you can do in empire of the sun and more whereas empire of the sun can't say that about pacific war the only thing empire of the sun nice. can claim over pacific war is that you can play the uh the full war in a shorter amount of time yeah and Okay, nice. 
one of the things that Pacific War that Herman has said, and it'll be interesting when we do the, because we're doing the whole war, is like Japan doesn't have a chance. <laughs> yeah. But if the meat and potatoes is in the, the campaign games, it's fine that Japan doesn't have a chance. So I don't know if Empire of the Sun, if you're playing the whole war scenario, if, if Japan has a chance or not. But in, yeah, I at mean, least in Pacific in War, Empire of the Sun. Do. If you get lucky, you could knock the the U.S.'s willpower down to zero. Um, it's possible, but most likely what you're going to do is you're just going to win on time. If the U.S. can't accomplish its goals by 1945, Japan wins. So that's that's Japan's best hope in Empire of the Sun. Nice. All right, Rich, before we rank it, closing, closing thoughts on the game. Anything else you feel like you need to share about it? <sighs> I mean... I, I, like I said, I, I've said it before, but I, I haven't had a game that's hooked to me like this since Advanced Squad later. There's there's not been a game that I just couldn't stop thinking about, couldn't take off the table. So that will lead right into where I think it should be ranked. <laughs> nice. I I really appreciate and respect and enjoy the scalability and the cleverness and the chrome and the navel and just go down the list of everything we talked about. It's not the game I expected when it showed up, you know, in that giant ass box or when I did that expertly produced uh, unboxing video. <laughs> um, it's different than what I had ever expected. It's not the same enjoyment out of I get out of something that's, you know, like purely strategic in the sense of something like U.S. Civil War. It'll be interesting to see if if the strategic game can can scratch that itch as, you know. Instead of doing it uh, op- of just one campaign, you're you're doing the full shebang. But damn, it's it's really good in a lot of different ways. And so I think we need to rank it. We do. So, folks, if this is your first episode of our show, we have a list, a list of every single war game ever made, ranked from best to worst. Right now. We have 56 games on our list, and so what Rich and I will do is we'll stick our hands out. We'll First, we'll put on blindfolds, and we'll start the crank to get the, the clay, the mud turning, and we'll stick our hands out, and we'll, we'll merely shape the clay, pull out where Pacific War needs to be ranked on this list from 1 to 57, somewhere between the U.S. Civil War, the best game of all time, or maybe above it, and above or below the worst game, Zeppelin Raider. Uh, anything else you want to say about the list? No, no, no. We're not going to need to talk about it. I think it's clear. Yeah. All right. So, I think it's safe to say this is in the top ten, meaning it's above Empire of the Sun. Sure, absolutely. Right now, okay. Empire of the Sun is ten, and I think we both agree this is better. Where Where do we even go with it? I I'm thinking up. I think it's better than Silver Bayonet. Here's what I would say. So, okay, go ahead and go ahead. If there was one scenario in this game, the Guadalcanal campaign and the, I don't know, 50 counters or whatever it needed, I would say that's a top 10 game. I like it that much. Okay. The fact that there's so much more in here on top of that, I mean, I've been joking about this, but I think this is a new number one. No, 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 no. Not yet. No. Nope. <laughs> nope. 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 I would play this over Civil War. I like Civil War. I've played Civil War quite a bit. Civil War didn't hook me the way this game does. Roads to Gettysburg 2 didn't hook me the way this game does. Atlanta really? Are. You're Even putting Rich- this above... You're putting this above probably the best GCACW product. I, it didn't hook me the way this game does. I liked Road to Gettysburg. I liked it a lot. I like this one better. Okay, so just to clarify, you like this more than Red Storm, yep. which yep. you have on multiple podcasts. Talked about how much you enjoy that. Absolutely. I okay. want to get that game back to my table because I haven't played Baltic Approaches yet. That's probably going to be the one that replaces this one on my table next month. And you like this more than that? Yes. I don't think this tells the same story that the U.S. Civil War does. I, I, as much as I enjoy it, what I love about the U.S. Civil War is you can try all the wacky shit. Mm-hmm. You can you can do a what if. You can say what if, what if, I don't know, you shot the Cumberland Gap and did this and 
or tried to take, you know, Memphis in the first year of the war or something, you know, like what if the Union invade Kentucky, whatever, you name it, it's there and you can see it played out and it tells such a great story. And the battles always come down to these epic moments and, and the characters are all there. I don't get that here. I don't like you? this game a lot. See, I, okay, I haven't played the strategic scenario, the full war yet. I mean, Neither honestly, I. that's that's going to take two, three years to play. But as I was playing the game, and as I was reading the Toll Trilogy, I was thinking about the things that that are now, in afterthought, considered to have been mistakes by our, our amazing admirals at the time. You know, why did we spend so much time taking Peleliu? We could have just skipped it. And I was thinking, as I was reading that book and playing this game, I can do that in this game. I can skip it. I can I can try to fix their mistakes, and I can see how they work. And to me, that's like the ultimate story to me, is is that, that alternate history that's not crazy alternate. It's just looking back and seeing what if we had been able to fix our mistakes. But does it matter if, if the Japanese don't even have a fighting chance? Well, sure it matters, because if we don't lose, you know, three divisions, you know, you know, does the war end a year earlier or whatever? So there are like some political pressures in the strategic game that will force a settlement. But that's like realistically the best outcome you can hope for as the Japanese. Not saying I'm not going to enjoy this and see what strategies the Japanese try to pull off to sway that political will, hold out as long as possible, knock the U.S. You can't knock them out. Just with how the game's set up, the U.S. supplies are just going to overpower them. Plus, you get the atomic bomb and all that stuff. So, on one hand, I get it. I think I reserve the right to re-rank this <laughs> once we're done playing the strategic game. I'm not saying we're going to finish. We didn't even finish Victory Games the Civil War, which... <laughs> do have some words about that uh, but i i'm not convinced that what i've seen would surpass the uh, civil war and rich okay let me ask you this hold on hold Just on i want to be say, very hold on, hold on hold on hold on <laughs> hold on hold on i want to disclose to you after my first battle scenario i was really considering it <laughs> I really was. So I'm open minded. After to Pearl it. Harbor? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, no. Battle, battle, yeah, battle. I know. Go on. Sorry, what were you saying? I just so, wanted to be uh, clear just, to just to clarify here. Um are you do you want it at two? Or or are you considering oh. below none but heroes or Rhodes to Gettysburg? Use I'll I'll bend a little bit here for you. I think Rhodes to Gettysburg is a GCACW masterpiece. Absolutely it is. And, and 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 I'm not taking that lightly when I say I like this game more. What has the what has the bigger flaw? Is none but heroes or or Pacific War? And I haven't played none, none but heroes, unfortunately. So none but heroes has two big knocks. The order system is unique and interesting, and it's cool that you write them out. But it's also it just needs to be reworked. It needs to be made more clear. And the other side is just turns take a long time. Um. But then, you know, we didn't even talk about this. When you're doing a campaign game, the the operating player, like, their math <laughs> of, like, figuring out, like, I have 43 command points. Yeah. All right. I'm going to activate and, all these and guys. And if oh, I activate more than 20, then I have to double them. And Right. Uh, yes. Exactly. And so, like, you do have some things that are kind of, like, unintuitive, right? Sure. Like, okay, you have this many points. All right, I'm going to activate all this stuff. Ah, that doubles it. Ah, damn it. I'm going to activate them for three weeks. Ah, and so, like, then you kind of, like, all right, I want to do this, and then I'm going to scale back. Because, like, in some campaign games, like, you're going to use them all right away and, and activate all your guys. Yeah, and now, you can't. Defender, you may not, but. You can't carry them over in the normal sense. You can designate right. them for a future month, but you can't yeah. just like say, oh, I've got four left over this month. I get to add four in the next month. Exactly. And so there are some unintuitive things going on here. Yeah. Do, what do I enjoy more topically? None but heroes. I mean, Antietam and None but Heroes are why I started this. Mm -hmm. But this game is not, or this list is not, every historical 
topic ever. All right, so let's do this. Now, we have a rule when we re-rank that you can't bump unless it goes up more than one space. Okay, but that's different for it's if different we're talking about... Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. going to play the strategic scenario next year, and we're going to revisit this next December. <laughs> I'm fine with that. And, and after I play the full strategic scenario next year, uh, it, I will... I'll be honest, if it's if it's not number one, I'll say so. But then you need to replay U.S. Civil War over the next year. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because we play have that not about played U.S. Civil War. Yeah, you and I have never played it. Right. I usually play that about once a year. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I, oh, man, I really like None But Heroes. <laughs> I mean, we're at the, this is the cream of the crop, though. There's nothing. I love Red Storm. I love Roads to Gettysburg, too. And this is even better. Okay. I will put it above none but heroes <laughs> for I think just the what you get and it's this whole scalability sure. and you play what you're interested in. If you're getting none but heroes, you're playing in Tedum. And yeah, sure there's small scenarios. You can do the cornfields, whatever. But you're getting none but heroes to do the whole freaking battle, right? Like you're going to, you know, you're not you're not buying a $150 <laughs> game to do the cornfield and be done with it. And Pacific War you have 36 different ways to experience this game. Okay, cut 10 of those off because once you do them, you're not going back to the engagement. Sure, I'm never so Pearl you Harbor have 25 yet. different scenarios. The battle scenarios are still fun. Yeah, absolutely. You don't, like, you don't drop them as soon as you move on to the campaign games. And I guarantee you won't drop the campaign games because the strategic game, none of us have time for that. Mark Herman's only done the whole war three times. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah, when we talk about the strategic scenario, there is one... It is the entire war. There's four. There are four. Oh, are there four strategic? There's like four or five. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I haven't There's made more that than one. far. Yeah, but we're doing Camp- the whole thing. Yeah, campaign is 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 the meat of it as far as I'm concerned. So that's yeah, where I've been agreed. going. But yeah. So I think just in terms of what the game accomplishes, Pacific War gets a lot of points for that. And it's, you know what? It, it's faults are nitpicks, right? Like I'm complaining about a rule book. Sure. There are things in none but heroes I don't like, right? You're right. It's number two. All right. I don't. I don't buy above the US four. Not yet. Not yet. I love so much about this game, Rich. I haven't played US Civil War since I got the uh, rule updates either. I need to play with the new rules. Yes, you do. I've never. I haven't had the. So far, it's been what the game can achieve that keeps roping me in. Like, oh, I want to see more of this. I want to see more of this. I want to see more of this. I haven't had my personal second bull run. Which was my so many rules mistakes were made in my first ever played the US of War. Yeah. But our game came down to our own second bull run. Like the whole battle, the whole game rode on that battle. Again, we were playing so wrong, but that's what it came down to. <laughs> and we had everything in the stack, you know? And I just walked away feeling like these are the games I want to play, and this is one of the best things I've ever done. I feel this that Pacific War is this great design. It's 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 fantastic. But there hasn't been a moment yet when I've been like, this is why I do that. I'm enjoying it, but there hasn't been like a holy shit, this is this is pod racing, you know. <laughs> I like that reference. And and that's why I think it's number two for now. All right. All right. Good with that? I can live with it. It's higher than Zeppelin Raider. We can agree on that. Yeah. And it I think it carries the same mark that Silver Bayonet does. Silver Bayonet has permission to move outside of our normal exceptions once we both play the full game of Post. Gosh. So many games to play, man. I think I think I want to play Silver Bayonet at a historic fest. I it's surprisingly I was thinking Dian Bin Fu, but I know I can make more progress in Silver Bayonet than I can in Dian Bin Fu. Yeah, and also I I think Silver Bayonet has more to tell me than DNB and Fu does right now. I think mm, I nice. I love DNB and Fu. It's great and I think I've seen what it is. Silver Bayonet, I don't think I've I've seen it all yet. Nice. So, Pacific War will carry the same mark. Just like Empire of the Sun has the mark cuz I I haven't played it, yada yada yada. But Pacific War, I'll agree with you. If we both walk out of the strategic game and say, "Wow, that was the best" You know, bi-weekly, that's the best 75 hours that I've ever experienced. Then, yeah, I'll move it. I'll nice. move it up one. But until then, it does not. Plus, U.S. of War has 
the best map I've ever seen. <laughs> and I don't like the map in Pacific War. Yeah. Well, can't complain with number two war game ever. Yeah, it's pretty good. Again, do not take our nitpicks as any real slight against this game. I I hope it just informs your decision, and I hope you take it aw- take away from us that um, this is a damn fine game. And I don't know what the eighty five version was like, but uh, I don't know. This is just this is good stuff. Excellent. So we got fifty seven now. What's that mean? Fifty seven, Rich. I think I have it down. I think that means we can stop when we have ranked 114 games. Okay. Or or when we play an uninterrupted full <laughs> Pacific War strategic entire war game. I think 100 hours. I think that's sleep. a new addition to the list, but um, <laughs> yeah, we'll take that one as well. Yeah, or we play all our games. Or we play the U.S. Civil War and no generals die over the course of the game. See, that's impossible <laughs> because in the U.S. Civil War, they're scheduled to die. Exactly. That's why yeah. we won't make that. And we could talk about the inferior <laughs> Civil War if we wanted to. Nice. Okay, you know what? I I knew you were a fan of it. I had my expectations set high. I didn't expect this high, but as soon as I started like picking up on some of those things from the rules... It's like, oh, this is going to be good. And then you see it in action. Yeah. And I was just like, hell yeah. Yeah. Oh, and four-player is going to rock. Like, we did four-player battle. Mm -hmm. Oh, four-player strategic is going to be so good. Yeah. Yeah. Haven't had a game surprise me like this in a while, so. Yeah, I agree with you. I Yeah, I that's a great statement. Cool. Nice. That's a pretty good game. Okay, that's our list, folks. Next month. We don't have anything well, I guess scheduled. Next which... week first. We should talk about that first. Next week. Or maybe the week after. When do we record again our end of year? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Sorry. But next month, Rich, we need to schedule our game for next month. We do. And so you can help us do that because we don't have anything picked yet by going to patreon.com slash history table, joining our Patreon. We were we so... stingy and took that away from our Patreons the last two Oosh. months. We sure did. So we're making it up to you. Rich, <laughs> we have a patron pick coming up, and it is fantastic. It is so good. So you've, you've got it, it already? We have. Oh, no, no, no. We have a um, uh, a table topper. I don't even remember what I called the tiers. A tier support level where someone just gets to pick the game. Like Patrick picked Reds and Don picked Arden 2044. Okay. Those type of games, right? Okay. It is a good one. I'm not going to say it on the air, but I'll give a little teaser. It's a Milton Bradley game, but don't unplug your car yet um, because, Rich, trust me, I am so hyped for it. Nice. But we're not here to talk about that because that will probably be February just based on how the schedule is going. We need to pick January's. Go to patreon.com slash history table. You will find a poll for January's vote. That poll is going to run until next episode, which is not January or late January. That's our end of the year ex- episode next week. So you're going to have less than a week to get your vote in. And what do you get to vote on? Well, Rich, what do they get to vote on? What's your pick? Well, my pick is a BCS game called Brazen Chariots. Nice. This is a game that's been sitting on my shelf for a while. Um, it is actually the only BCS game I haven't played yet, so I'm looking forward to getting that, and I've even got the book of the same name sitting here on my desk. Very good. Not Aerocourt. Interesting. No, I, it, only because I've played Aerocourt. I don't think we... Well, obviously, we haven't reviewed it, but I just really want to play Berries and Chariots. I'm going to play it either way, so go ahead and vote for it. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'd be down for that. Like I have it on my shelf. Any Aerocourt, Last Blitzkrieg, or Berries and Chariots. Sure. Uh, all right. Are you ready for mine? I am ready. Short game extravaganza. Not one game. Not two games. Not three games. Not four. No, Rich. Five games. That's ridiculous. In one month. Here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> Short is the Tripoli. Red flag over Paris. Okay. Flashpoint. South China Sea. A name that I a game that is escaping me right now. We'll get right back to it. And then three hundred. And what's that little now, naval three of card those game? We could play on Rally the Troops Camp. Exactly. Nice. And that's my point. And we could get a lot of participation going, play with a lot of different people. And what's get a that, lot of games in. What's that naval version of upfront? Naval version of upfront. Oh, I played it at Donkey Kong. I've talked about it. 
You don't expect me to remember that, do you? Oh, I do. It's not I on do. OTT, is it? No, 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 no. But I'm sure it's on Vassal. It's so easy to play. Hold on. Anyways, so the idea behind short game extravaganza is I think we could do something fun, like set a timer, like a 10-minute timer for each game or something like that, or five minutes. What Attack sub. Attack sub is what I'm oh, thinking okay. of. Uh, very quick, easy game to play. A lot of fun. Uh, we'd probably have to play on Vassal. So there's your five games in short game extravaganza. We could change that if, if there's an outcry, but set five minutes, seven and a half minutes, whatever. That's all we can talk about that game. Get it ranked, move on to the next one. Mm. Those are all five games that are a lot of fun to play. I have different opinions on all of them, but I think it'd be a fun exercise. I think you sold yours a lot better than I sold mine. I switched my vote for you. <laughs> well, I, I would be happy with either. Whether <laughs> like it gets I said, picked I'm going to in- play Berries and Chariots either way. Right, and I'm going to continue to play all of those games, probably not attack them, all of those games anyways, because I like them that much. And if it doesn't get picked in January, it'll stay on the ballot, because what happens is we've got our nominations on there. You can go vote for them, and we'll throw some other ones out there. It doesn't have to be Brazen Chariots. It doesn't have to be Short Game Extravaganza. It can be Risk. No, Risk won't be on the ballot. Something else will be on the ballot, but it could be that. So, go check out the ballot. Join our Patreon. We appreciate all of your support. Patreon.com slash history table. Get your vote in. Nice. Excellent. Rich, we have another listener question. Is this Patrick's question? It is. All right. It is Patrick's. I was hoping we'd get to this. this of is, course. This is what everyone's been waiting for. All right. Ch- Are Chester we just going to do his first question? Or are we going to expand it into the uh, ridiculousness that it became? Maybe we can just roll forward with it like an ongoing thing. <laughs> so let's 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 lay the groundwork first, okay? Uh, Chester Nimitz, aka Chesty, or MacArthur, who wins over ten rounds in the boxing ring? I know my answer right away, but go ahead. Uh, I'm... Nimitz or MacArthur? I'm I'm gonna have to go with MacArthur. No, really? MacArthur's a douche. <laughs> it doesn't mean he can't. I mean, I don't. I'm not convinced that MacArthur even, wouldn't even have had someone else. Even as a former sailor, I, I think I'm going to put it to the guy that like actually fought in ground combat. That's a good point that I didn't factor into this <laughs> at all. Um, I had just assumed that MacArthur would have someone else box for him because he's a little yeah, punch, that's probably punk-ass the bitch. case. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going Chesty. Okay, that surprises me. I thought we would both pick the opposite. <laughs> Conversely. As past, or states Patrick, who is better at pillow talk? Mm. I'll take this first because although he looked like a serious fella, I get the impression that our old friend Chesty was a little bit of a lush. <laughs> and what I took away from Conquering Tide, um, the first book of the Crucible, the Ian Toll book we just talked about, is well, Chesty was a little softy. You wouldn't get it just from looking at him at first. Like, he had a rough appearance, but something tells me that old Chessy was an old sweetheart. So, Chessy better at pillow talk. See, I'm going to agree with you on this one. I'm going to go with Nimitz, but for a totally different reason. I think MacArthur would talk about nothing but himself. Yes. And that would not be, uh, not be, a, very, uh, not be a very generous lover. Very good. I don't think we need to expand it to Chessy, Chessy, and... MacArthur. Unless you disagree. No, we'll let it go there. Okay. But next week you can tune in to see. So overall winner, I think is Nimitz. Yeah. Yeah. He got uh, three votes versus one. Okay. So next episode, next regular episode, not in the recap, we'll do another. We'll see how long Nimitz can keep it going, right? Like we'll put someone else in the ring. We'll put someone else in the bed. Ooh, I like it. Does it have to be a Pacific War commander? I think we'll run out of like we meaningful could go with Pacific Matahari. War. <laughs> who? Matahari. Well, I mean, I'm going to give it to Nimitz because I don't even know who that is. She was a spy. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I, now I got you. <laughs> okay, so, mm, I feel like that's going in a direction that I don't want to take the podcast <laughs> if we talk. But we're just talking pillow talk. We're not talking about any other thing. So we are expanding beyond Pacific War, right? Uh yeah, I think we have to. Well, we can go to stay in World War Two. We're gonna. That's what I was gonna ask. She died in 1917. So are we gonna go? 
Yeah, I think we'll expand slowly. We'll go to ETO first. Okay, here's here's what I need from her. You can have like a late war Rommel or early war Rommel. (laughs) (laughs) We need to expand this. Boxing ring, fine. Pillow talk, love it. We need we need a third category, yeah. like drinkability um, or something like that. Not serious. I don't want this to actually be based on any <laughs> sense of military prowess or anything like that. Oh, here you go. This is the best. Who, who would you, who would you rather heard. who would you rather bring home to introduce to your parents? Mom, dad, this is Chesty. Mom, dad, this is Doug. Like, <laughs> well, we got to go Monty, right? Oh, gosh. I mean, he's going to get blown out of the water. <laughs> we can do a loser's bracket between Monty and MacArthur. All right. So I, those may be our three criteria. Who would you rather bring home to mom and dad? Pillow talk ability and boxing ring ability. And if we want to expand that, we can. So uh, Nimitz, will will see how long he can keep the title, right? All right. Great. He's I'm looking forward to that. He's got the belt. All right. We need a, we need a name for it. Mm. Charles S. Roberts War. <laughs> <laughs> Every commander ever. <laughs> Every, yeah. Awesome. Well, Rich, look at that transition. I know, I'm you mentioned. To segue. That's what I meant. Transition. Segway. Shit. Charles S. Roberts Awards <laughs> 2021 winners were announced. And I thought we'd go through it. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. You want to hit everything or just the things we care about? I think just the things we care about. I mean, I th- so I would say the first thing is, is it was nice to kind of look over the list and not see anything that made me kind of gag. So that was good. I know yeah. you had a little bit of one, but nothing nothing crazy like the, the, the U-boat year. Which, I mean, on one hand, I don't even, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, obviously, where we're taking the historical board game awards are different than the Charles S. Roberts, just like the scale of voting. Right. So like on one hand, I love that you boot one because it's a public vote. And if that's what they're all going to vote for, then I'm, I'm fine with that. And that's just going to be the nature of when you allow everyone to vote on things, you're going to have years where weird things get in. I do think this like public vote for nominations is a good deal because then you narrow, like, Having only some games where people voted on was kind of a wacky thing. So this whole deal, like you get six finalists and then everyone votes on those finalists, much better approach. So hopefully the new directions that Ardwolf has that running in and everyone else on the the committee, very excited to see where they go for the Charles S. Roberts. So yeah, all in all, I think, I mean, it took, we're almost in 2023, two days to go, uh, but the results are here and it seems like uh, it's going in good directions. So yeah. anything jump out at you? Uh, yeah. So one thing I I wouldn't even normally talk about this, but I was actually on against Sod's website for another game the other day, and that Rome Ink game jumped out at me. And so this one, best ancients to medieval. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I've I've seen the buzz on that and haven't had a chance to play it, but I was definitely interested in it. Yeah. Um. And we won't hit on every category, but best early gunpowder board war game, Bayonets and Tomahawks, got to win here. Sure. Um, which is fantastic and well deserved. Not a super strong like category, I think. But then another game that I super enjoy for best late gunpowder is Red Flag over Paris won, but that was up against that War of the Triple Alliance game, which I've heard is fantastic, and I'm excited to to play. Best American Civil War board game. I think it's probably a little surprise that GCACW won with Hood Strikes North. And that was the that was the small one that came out this year, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, and that was up against a lock and load game and a Hollandsville John Thiessen game. game. And then it was against Thunder at Dawn Thunder as well, Dawn. which I yeah. enjoyed the hell out of. Yes. That, to me, is a category that's like, all right, what did I miss? Yeah. See, that's a kind of tough one for me. I mean, just looking at Thunder at Dawn and Hood Strikes North. I haven't <laughs> played Hood Strikes North, but obviously I'm a huge fan of the series. Thunder at Dawn as a game itself was fantastic. Yeah, I would probably vote. I And I don't remember what I did, but I think I would go with Thunder at Dawn just because yeah. Hood Strikes North was kind of like, if if I look at my shelf of GCACW, Hood Strikes North is leaving. Um, and 
that like I would pick every other one before I'd pick Quick Strike Storm. Yeah. Just like topically, whatever. Uh, World War One. I, I mean, that's not my cup of tea. But yeah, and I'm gonna say none of these. I really, I don't really know anything about. It wasn't a big year for World War One games that caught my attention. Yeah, World War Two game and uh, cutting ahead a little bit, game of the year, Atlantic Chase, fantastic. I man, I need to reach out and to Hector and pick our Atlantic Chase game back up because that the campaign is awesome and just like your objectives in that game are just so different than what I'm used to. Like in Fleet, you know, like seek so and destroy, but uh, Atlantic Chase so good. Yeah. I mean, obviously, World War Two. There's always a ton of good games on that one, but that's a stacked category. I mean, you've got so it's Third interesting. Winter, Panzer's Last Stand, oh, yeah. Conquest and Consequence. I mean, that's that's a lot. <laughs> that's a you know, that's a pretty good showing, right? Oh sure. I I mean, like, what a strong category: Atlantic Chase, Absolute War, Conquest, and Consequence, Panzer's Last Stand, Third Winter. I, I know you just said those, but like, and then you still have Zero Leader tacked onto that. Mm-hmm. Which I'm not a fan of those games, but they are very popular, obviously, especially sure. with solitaire kit players. Uh, Oath won Best Science Fiction Fantasy. Um, and I'm not like mad that that's not a comment of like, Oath, what is that Euro S game doing in my peanut butter? It's more <laughs> like, I just haven't heard good things about Oath. Yeah, but looking at the other ones, like I didn't even know there was a World of Warcraft Wrath of the Lich game game. That is a pandemic game, and I've heard oh, it's fantastic. It? Okay. All right. Yeah, like I heard it's real good. Interesting enough, if you go to Magazine War Games, Rome Inc. did not win Magazine <laughs> War Games. Yeah. Hanute, which I have played a little bit. Um, and it was. Dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. Best graphics bin. It's Tomahawk set map is beautiful. Best rules, Atlantic Chase. That's pretty great. And then the War Games of the Year were a lot of those World War II games we mentioned. Um, with Atlantic Chase winning it. Atlantic Chase, Bayonets, Tomahawks, NATO, Panzer's Last Stand, and Third World War. Yeah. I've heard good things about NATO, that new Compass Games. Yes. Yeah. That new one. So, um, I've got a friend here in town that has it, but I haven't played it yet. So. so, speaking of hearing good things, our friend at the bottom of the list, Greg Smith, I've been messing around with and talked with our buddy Don about Imperial Tide. Have you messed with or looked into the the Pacific Tide series or it's it's got this really interesting aspect of rebuying cards. Have you looked at this at all? No, I have not. So look, Zevlin Raider obviously not for me, probably not for a lot of people. I was reluctant because it's the same designer. And this is Imperial Tide is a World War One. If you like, if you close your eyes a little bit and like peer through your eyelashes and look at the map, you're like, wait, is that Paz of Glory or is that something else? Um, it's point to point World War One game, <clears throat> but it's got this whole card driven system where you like rebuy cards. It's based off a World War Two game called Pacific Tide, uh, <clears throat> and I've been messing around with that solo. It's remember when I asked, do you like scripted openings in in war games? Like you have yeah, to play yeah, this card. We talked about that. Yeah, this this has that, and so that's what kind of like stirred it. Like, do you do I like this? I and I'm not really convinced one way or another. Um, and this has nothing to do with the Charles S. Roberts. Um, but it, it, when you said like hearing good things, is I had heard a lot about this, and it's like, all right, I'm going to give them another another try. It's a pretty interesting system. Um, the the Pacific Tide stuff. So, hmm. okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I don't don't sleep on it, you know, because there's there's more than enough reasons to kind of pass it up, and it both it and Pacific Tide flew under my radar for. Yeah. I mean, it's Compass. I think and I so, remember looking at Imperial Tide before, and I mean, knowing nothing about it, but like looking at the map and knowing that it's got cards, I remember thinking, I mean, the first. It, like Pass the Glory came to mind. Right, that's right. That's what I'm saying. If you yeah. close your eyes a little bit, it's like, what is? which one is that? Way less points, like not not as many places to go, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, and again, it's Compass, so uh, the, you know, the, the pattern for Compass for a lot of people right now should be wait and see. Yeah, sure. And this was a wait and see, and I, I don't think people should sleep on it. And the good thing is Miniature Market does carry Compass games, so if it's a wait and see and it looks good, then... 
do it. Okay, I want to bring this. It's not a listener question per se, but it came up on the Discord, and I thought it was somewhat interesting. And it all, uh, John R. posted this comment from Reddit, and I don't know who the original Reddit poster was, but um, the comment was essentially that Hex Encounter games feel procedural because war games aren't about the actual units in conflict and resolving battles. They're slow, dry games about how you move pieces. And I'm going to stop there because everything else, the original question wasn't about the rest of it. I And the more I thought about that sentence, the first thing I was like, throw and <laughs> slow and dry, how dare you, sir? But the more I think about it, the more I think that I I don't like like broad sweeping statements like most hex encounter games are, are this. Sure. But the more I think about it, the more I think it's true is and it brought up some interesting discussion and even talked about like memoir and stuff. But even in memoir, and I don't even know if I have a question for you than just like a time to reflect in memoir maneuver is not as important or as robust as it is as it is and say something like GCACW. Sure. But how you move your pieces and where, where you position them on the map obviously is more important and more of a detailed process than resolving combat in that game. So even if you have something on the range of memoir 44, which is, you know, just about as new player friendly as you can get in terms of hex encounter or other war games, there are no counters, I guess. But, then I was like, okay, what about Next War? Because Next War has all these combat steps. But even then, most of those combat steps are just simple roll the dice, see the results. And all your actions and decisions leading up to you rolling the dice are more important than the combat and resolving the battle. And I don't know, did, did you have any, one, did you have any strong thoughts on this? Or, and two, can you think of anything, and it doesn't have to be Hex Encounter, but in broad war game sense, that would fit the bill of being more focused on resolving the battle than it is about positioning and moving your troops. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a broad statement that it's it's hard to know how to really attack it because there's so many different games that try to do different things. I mean, you sure. have games that have hidden pieces. So, you know, in a game like Silver Bayonet or Vietnam 6575, it's combat resolution may not matter at all because all you did was waste your time and operations <laughs> points in turning over a piece that was a political section and didn't exist anyway. So in right. that case, the combat resolution means absolutely nothing. Um, I mean, I can't think of a game where combat resolution is the focus of the game because I mean, in the word itself, resolution, it's its always the end result. It's its the last thing that happens as a result of everything else you've done. And everything else is, I mean, it is things like maneuver and using terrain, but it is in part using actual units to their strengths and advantages. And some games do this other ways than others, but I mean, if you've got a game where you've got tanks, you know, you don't want your tanks to fight in the marsh. You want them to fight in the open ground. So you've got multiple axes of strategy in where you use certain pieces to to try to get that resolution. But ultimately, the resolution is just the last stage in the process. Right. And I again, I apologize to the original poster on Reddit but just because I only had a screen grab and I, I didn't go yeah. look for it. But and they conclude skip ahead some stuff is every time you move a counter you're making a critical decision and I'll, I'll just stop there and i think that's that's a point of it it's not i don't think it's an attack again i mean they do call it slow dry games which again how dare you <laughs> but i i do think it is interesting and it, it probably boils down to like real life to a certain extent right i mean obviously your your firefights are way different and do come down to the actual units and the resolution of battle but I would imagine as a civilian 100% is maneuver and positioning is just as crucial as, as part. But yeah. if, if you just look at it from a game perspective, uh, I don't think it's a bad thing that an important thing is, is how you move your troops when you decide to move your troops, what you do with your troops or units or resources or whatever. Um, I just thought it was an interesting comment that at first, at first I like was really abrasive. I was like, Whoa, but then the more I thought about it, I was like, well, maybe this this actually does hold more true. And saying that most war games are this way actually isn't that wrong. Yeah. I mean, you've got die rolls to stop it from being deterministic. But ultimately, 
as a player, what you're trying to do is to put yourself in the best situation to win where, you know, I mean, die roll, maybe it's not going to be 50-50, but maybe I can change it so that it's going to be 70-30 in my favor. And I could still lose, but I've done everything that I can to increase my odds. Right, right. I, I then it, so I asked the question on the Discord, and I, I think the best answer was was Mitch's answer, and one of the only answers was what games are focused on, <laughs> on combat. And sure, I, I guess it depends on what type of D and D you're playing, but if you're just doing theater of the mind, yeah, combat resolution probably is more important when you get in a battle. Obviously, not when you're sitting in a tavern or role playing whatever, but when you get in a battle in in D and D the resolution is more of the aspect than positioning. Yeah. But that could vary from game to game. So then I got to thinking like, well, what would a, a game focused on combat resolution even look like if you were just playing it from a game? And I, and, and the game that I thought of when that question was asked was a game like gladiator, where it's just two guys fighting out. But even then you're trying to get to his side and you're back. There's still maneuver aspects of it. Oh, sure. You can't take that out of it, right? But to make it its primary focus, you know what I thought of is you'd have to take of something like Captain Sonar. Yeah. Right? Where you're trying to, like, conduct a task where, I don't know, like, you gamify firing artillery, right? Like, you have to reload and eject the shell and whatever process is involved in firing like a world war one piece of artillery like you would gamify that and like make it a stressful situation to make sure you carry out all the steps not saying that's a particularly good game but i think you (laughs) fundamentally like you're not talking about a hex encounter game anymore because that's not your focus anyways yeah i mean if it's a hex encounter game then there is an aspect to maneuver because otherwise, right. why do you have hexes encounters? Well, and especially, I mean, that's also the point of hexes, right? I mean, yeah. like that's why hexes work so well is you have six yeah. points of maneuver. Anyways, I just thought it was thought it was fun, and it brought up some some good conversation on the Discord, and of course, brought up the question of uh, strategic, tactical, and operational, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Nice. Okay, uh, Rich, you read a book. So we're in the other stuff. We're yeah, we're I'm actually soon, not but... done with it yet. We're maybe, I don't know, half or two thirds of the way through it. I can't remember how much, but we're reading 112263 by Stephen King. Have you heard of this uh-huh. one? Have you read it? Uh, no, my mistake was I watched the Hulu show first. Oh, and I should okay. Have read it See, I didn't even know there was a Hulu show. And, That's pretty good. I mean, I, I, I know it now, but um, so yeah, once I found that out, it's like, yeah, watch this afterwards. But it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's sci-fi ish. It's about a guy that travels back in time. I mean, the, the, the broad scope is it to stop the Kennedy assassination, but um, there's a lot more to it. And it's, it's, it's a pretty fascinating book. I mean, I've read some, I've read several Stephen King books, not, not all of his by any means, but I like his writing quite a bit and, and this is just top notch. So I'm enjoying it quite a bit. My wife is loving it. So yeah, well, we're enjoying it. Yeah. Well, I do recommend the show once, once you're done. That's good to hear. I'm glad it. Um, and did the show cover the whole book? Yeah. Okay. It was all contained in one season and had James Franco in it. Okay, cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So that's what, that's the other book that I've been reading that didn't really fit under the categories before. So Yeah, that's why we plug them in back here. Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to be back real so- soon to talk about our end of the year stuff. So you won't miss us. And then we'll be back at the end of January. And then Rich and I will be together in February. It's going to be good. No, I can't oh, I have the hiccups. Looking forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, awesome. That's going to do it for us, folks. Again, you can go to our Patreon.com, support the show, get ready for your vote. Um, I am now on uh, Mastodon, which you can find. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but this is where we also plug the Discord because – Hands down, the best place to interact with all of us is joining our Discord. There is a link in the show notes. You just join that, and you're in. You're good. Um, come hang out. Introdu- if you do join, introduce yourself so we know who you are. Uh, you can check out our website, historyonthetable.com. Rich, you're no longer on Twitter? I'm no longer on Twitter. No, nope. oh, good I, for you. Um, don't want to make a big deal out of it or anything. I just didn't want to be there anymore. I have not joined Mastodon yet either, so... I'm just kind of holding off on that. I might do that eventually, but for now, less social media is probably better. Hey, but man, I am on Discord. I, it's not that you can't find me. You can talk to me. I just don't need to be blasted by everything in the whole world. So Discord is an excellent place to get a hold of me. 
hey i love that and respect that um yeah that's that's good stuff we still have a twitter presence at least for for me and that's at history table pod um so yeah you can join that there but again discord all the way or you can shoot us an email history table podcast at gmail.com and if you really want i can get a p.o box if you want to send us a letter but don't do that <laughs> all right i think that's it yeah hey l- uh let us know what games you want us to play next month because we don't have as much time this time so yes yeah, that's why I want to get the vote in and done by the time we record so we can announce it, and especially if we're going to do BCS yeah. uh, and get rolling on that. And Brazen Chariots, that has the new rules, right? And I think that's why I own it. Uh, I don't remember, but I mean, I always, anytime I play a new BCS game, I just, I've got the uh, the rules yep. online, so. Sure, sure. That makes sense. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. Uh, happy New Year. This should go out before New Year's Day, and it'll obviously it'll go out before our end of the year episode. But uh, Happy New Year. Thank you so much to all of you for making 2022 uh, uh, just a great year for Rich and I. Uh, we had some good stuff this year, I think. Yeah, I'm looking forward to 2023. It's going to be lots of good stuff. That's right. Awesome. Yeah. All right, happy, folks. Happy New Year, everyone. Hopefully you guys will listen to this right after you wake up from a uh, time or something. There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah, hopefully tomorrow. <laughs>